Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a early impression video on a very special fragrance from a category which I absolutely love. Uh, but before we get into it, I just want to say thank you to, again, everyone who's got us over the 4,000 subscriber mark. I know subs really don't matter and to most people 4,000 is nothing anyways, but to me it does mean a lot and I'm thankful to every single person who has subscribed. And uh, I'm going to do a 4,000 subscriber blast video, if you will. Uh, where we're going to do a top 100. I've been working on that. That's been sort of taking up a lot of my fragrance time. But um, I wanted to just probably take this afternoon and tonight and just do some quick, uh, quick hit videos, if you will, early impressions. And this is a fragrance I've worn to bed once before, and now I'm getting to wear it as my scent of the day for the very first time. And uh, I'm really, really liking this fragrance. It's from a house which I've never talked about on the channel. And um, usually when I introduce a new house like this, I like to go through some of the background. So this as an intro video may be a little bit shorter or longer, shorter than most. My videos are never short, but uh, maybe a little bit longer than uh, the average just quick hit video. But that's because I want to go through and talk about some of the back history of the house. And this is from a house called Ariza L. Legrand, and the fragrance is called Chipra Mousse. And Chipra Mousse, interestingly enough, originally was released in 1914. Uh, and then it was now re-released about a decade ago in 2013. The brand had like a revival, I think. And um, um, they did like a relaunch of the brand. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the backstory. There's some very interesting info. I'm going to read an interesting facts little blurb from Parfumo. And then I'm actually going to go to the... Uh, website, which is arizaparfums.com. I would urge you to go to that website. It's actually a really cool website. Lots of neat pictures and stuff like that. But it says, when a perfume house has been in business since 1720, it's usually for a good reason. This is from Parfumo. This is the case of Ariza L. Legrand. In addition to a wealth of experience and centuries of olfactory creations with the finest ingredients, the founder of Ariza L. Legrand was the perfumer uh, Farjon Amy, often referred to as Elder Farjon. He was a pharmacist and chemist, but exper experimented with recipes for fine cosmetics, which he said he received from famous courtesan Ninon de Lenchlos. This gave Ani access to the French court and led to the foundation of his legendary label. And since Ani used a lot of Oriza rice in powder form in the laboratory, he chose this name. Over the years, Ariza El Legrand has had new and creative owners expanded to new locations and contributed many recipes, processes, and patents to the label. By the end of the 1930s, the company had suddenly disappeared from the market. It wasn't until 2012 that Ariza El Legrand unexpectedly reappeared thanks to Franck Belache. The palette of fragrances from the house of Ariza El Legrand ranged from luxurious perfumes, all in very noble flacons, to room fragrance, sprays and candles and stuff like that to high quality skin and body care these include for example precious scented soap in historical packaging lip balms eyes hands and face for different skin types as well as various bath salts and small porcelain bottles in addition the label also sells refill packs for almost all products to focus on sustainability so i just want to read you this little blurb from the website i would recommend going to arizaparfums.com and going through this as well because there's some really cool pictures but it says, in 1720, during the reign of Louis XV, uh, Farjon Ani, perfumer and distiller to the court, gave birth to Maison Oriza. Cool picture of Versailles and stuff like that. Louis XV, the king of France, was uh, Farjon's first client and bestowed him the honor of being an official purveyor to the court. The Farjon, and I'm assuming I'm mispronouncing Farjon, because uh, I always mispronounce things, but um, if I am mispronouncing it to all my French speakers... My truest apologies, but it'll my Texas accent will never change. The Farjon family kept this honor intact until the reign of Louis the Sixteenth, thanks to the favors of Marie Antoinette, known for her refined tastes. Farjon Ani gave Ariza its name as a nod to the rice powder he used to make his powders and and body unguents. There's an unguents. Uh, after the revolution, the French Revolution, and the monarchy ended, but the ancient Maison. Farjan uh, remained and became a purveyor of perfumes to Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and his wife, Empress Josephine, as well as Emperor Napoleon III. In 1811, Mr. Louis Legrand became the sole owner 
of the Maison and set up the Perfumerie Ariza at 207 Rue Saint Honoré in Paris. He managed the company for years and it bloomed under his rule. Antoine Reynaud, his partner, succeeded him in 1860. Keen to perpetuate the prestige of this wealthy house, he set up the very first steam-powered perfume factory in uh, Levois-Petit, uh, in Levois-Petit, Parrot? I'm sure it's not Parrot. I'm going to go with Petit. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but again, apologies. The House of Ariza Elegrand became the official and patented supplier of the greatest foreign courts, Russia, Italy, England, and purveyor of perfumes to the French court until Napoleon III. Um, Antoine Reynaud gave Ariza Elegrand its finest hours by opening the perfumerie Ariza, which would change the history of French perfumery. In 1879, a new shop opened um, in France. Beautiful pictures of it. Innovations. During the second half of the 19th century, Ariza Elegrand factory was an economic and social model of its kind and at the center stage in the rise of the modern perfume industry. Perfumery Ariza became one of the first to develop a true range of cosmetic products scented with the house's very own fragrances. In 1887, the world's very first solid perfume was created at the Levois Petty factory. I'm going to assume that's true. Um, the refinement of the fragrances of Maison Ariza Elegrands was only matched by the elegance and prestige of their flacons made of Baccarat crystal. Um, in the spring of 1890, Antoine Reynaud opened a prestigious bouquet at 11 Place de la Madeleine. Uh, the elegant women of Paris come, came in numbers and perfumery Ariza Elegrand enjoyed an immense popularity in France and even more so abroad. Again, beautiful pictures. Um, talks about some of its reputations at the World Fairs. Um, in, in 1900, Paris's World Fair renowned two centuries of industrial know-how and innovation by awarding its Grand Prix to Ariza Elegrand, which entered the new style in century, in, uh, the new century in style. Its creativity, its avant-garde vision, and the incredible quality of its compositions enabled Ariza Elegrand to be considered for almost three centuries as one of the most prestigious perfume houses in history. So, how's that for a quick rundown of the house? Uh, probably some people are rolling their eyes at, you know, supplying the French court and the Russian court and all of this stuff that sounds very similar to BS from some other houses that we've heard over the years. But I'm sure there were houses that did supply the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the, the royal courts at the time. So someone had to do it. And, you know, the Russian, Italy, England courts, whatever they were, um... And so I, it can't all be BS. Obviously, there were some perfume houses that, um, you know, had royal charters and seals and stuff like that to make perfume for the for the royal courts. Um, but obviously, how much does that play into the modern product? Probably not so much, but it's a cool little backstory. So uh, one thing that I will tell you before we get started about Shipra Moose is if you've been following the channel, I have had a um, little bit of an earthy, mushroomy kick lately because I talked about a fragrance yesterday called Bortnikov Triad, which has an oud in it, uh, a Chinese uh, Hainan oud, which basically has this earthy, ashy quality to it. I've talked about uh, Aris Ladore's History of Chinese Oud, which also had a very similar earthy, mushroomy-like quality. And there is a very famous mushroom note in this, and we'll get to that. So, um, let me read the blurb on Shepra Moose according to the brand. So it says, The Dandy's Perfume. After the first rains of September, the woods exude scents of peat moss and petrichor. The ideal time to stroll under the dripping canopy and enjoy a much-needed cool breeze after the scorching summer heat. Autumn has come, the time to meditate, to observe nature as it prepares for the coming of the swift winter and its first ores. The thickest, the thickets and the glades where... Their many colored dresses, their tender copper leaves smelling of soothing scents. Soon now, the mossy paths, precious jewels of, of the undergrowth will welcome a layer of dead leaves burnished by the waning rays of the sun. Sheeper Moose reminds us of nature's last colored garments before the first snowfalls of winter. The fragrance of damp forest by the glen of golden barks uh, and maroon leaves of fresh tree moss and roasted chestnuts by the hearth. She promotes the centennial fragrance of 
Marisol Ariza El Legrand, launched in 1914 for all the dandies of the world. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting take on a Shifra to me because um, it's, it's extremely unique although it keeps its mind sort of in the past, okay? So it uh, it stays true to its classy style. And there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to smell, which I instantly like, okay? And so the opening, when you first spray this, the opening is extremely fresh and uplifting. And that's the very first thing you're going to notice is there are these notes, which they claim the top notes are wild mint, fennel, and what they call green sprouts, okay? Uh, now, I will tell you that according to Parfumo, there's a lot more going on. There's corn mint, uh, there's uh, clary sage, which can sometimes have this sort of earthy, sweaty quality to it. And um, But the opening, for the most part, has this very uplifting, refreshing smell. So I want you to imagine sort of this green forest vibe. And um, it really does hit the nail on the head when you first spray. Imagine this... Um, hectic back and forth of your day, like let's say you're doing whatever you do all day, if you're working or something, you're on the phone, you're talking to people, you're making notes in a computer, you're going to appointments or whatever you're doing, and all of a sudden you just find yourself in this peaceful place. You're walking, let's say, you just maybe between appointments you decided to go to a park and take a quick stroll, and so you're walking amongst the, um, the, the trees and the bushes and the flowers, and you're walking and you just sort of find this spot that just seems peaceful, you know, and you take a moment to yourself, you know, and you take a deep breath and you just appreciate the beauty of the of the forest all around you. And you realize just how vibrant and full of life it is. And uh, most of the time we're ignoring all of the little details because we're rushing through our lives doing a million different things, right? And this is the opening is so energetic and vibrant and yet it almost has this ability to like slow down time where you can just sort of take a look around and appreciate everything that's going on around you. And there is this minty freshness, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and the minty freshness to me is definitely there. Now, some people say it's like a mint tea like smell that it reminds them of maybe like this mint tea, which I love mint tea. Um, and I can completely see that because tea can also have this slightly earthy like character to it. And, um, you know, the earthiness and the complexity of the perfume really comes out, uh, comes across, I would say, different to different people. So some see the earthiness as uh, sweaty and peat, peat moss-like and soily, and others see the nuttiness more early on because there is a roasted chestnut note, like they mentioned in the write-up. So there's this roasted chestnut note that's listed in the base, but... Um, you know, you get it much sooner. There's also this beautiful Angelica note in here, which I reviewed Frederick Mall's uh, Uncut Gem recently, and I talked a little bit about how the Angelica note in that fragrance seems very similar to the Angelica used in Bois de Rage, but Bois de Rage, or French Lover, if you will, depending on whether you're in the U.S. or Europe, um, has a little bit of a different vibe in that it really lasts into, into the dry down, that, that green, earthy quality of Boiterage or French Lover lasts into the dry down, whereas with Uncut Gem, it's sort of, you know, what would you say? I'm trying to be nice here. It, it's it's sort of morphed into this um, slightly boring, musky, maybe even a little bit of too much Ambroxin in the dry, that kind of a ambros Ambrosinide, they called it. Um, and and so they're, they're different fragrances, but Angelica, the Angelica part of, even of Uncut Gem, I loved because the opening really focused on the angelica and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, you know, green, earthy note. Um, love angelica. It's one of my one of my secret notes. If I see angelica in a fragrance, I know I'm gonna probably like it. And here it's executed brilliantly. And um, if you know my taste in fragrances, right? Um, Shepra, it to me, is one of my favorite categories. So a couple of fragrances I've talked about, I need to review these. I have so many fragrances. I have, you know, big decants like this or full bottles I want to review, but I'm focusing on stuff like this that I don't have a bottle and I may never have a bottle. And so I want to put my thoughts out there, right? But um, there's always this back and forth between I want to review the stuff I love and own, but I also want to review the new stuff that I don't own because who knows if I'll ever get a chance to smell it and review it in the future, right? Uh, and so this is 
uh, MDCI Sheepra Palaton. Pretty, this is like a 30 mil decant. Um, and this is uh, Sheepra Siam. I just grabbed a couple fragrances that literally say Sheepra on the tin, right? It says it on the bottle. And if you say Sheepra on the bottle, you better do what you say you're going to do. Um, you, you can't put Sheepra on the bottle and have it uh, not perform, right? You better do what it says. Now, this is sort of like a mixture of an Oriental and a Sheepra, kind of like Rochas Femme, if you will. But, oh God, I'll tell you what, man. I... Um, I absolutely love sheep or fragrances, and there's this, um, so, so, uh, for me, this fragrance right off the bat, I knew I liked it because I wore it to bed, but when you wear it as your scent of the day, you get different aspects of it that you just don't, um, pick up when you just sort of spray it on before bed or something like that to me, and so, for a sheep or lover like myself, um, this, this is a fragrance that absolutely delivers exactly what it says it, it does. This is, this is um, a beautiful green resinous sheepra. And we'll get to that in just a second. But um, a couple other notes in here that you'll mention. There's some mastic. There's some clover. There's a lot of oak moss in here. Or, you know, this came out in 2013. So this is not a vintage bottle or anything like that. I'm pretty sure this is a new bottle uh, that this came from. By the way. I was remiss in the opening, so excited about talking about some of the history of the house. I forgot to say thank you to Nick, who provided me with this brilliant, very generous sample. More than enough for me to wear, get to know, you know, take my time. Like I said, I wore it to bed once before, um, so I've had a chance to sort of get to know it, and, and very generous and kind of him, so thank you, Nick. Um, so the opening for me really gives you this um, sprightly, energetic, that really high, you know, the 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 thing that popped in my head as I was wearing this today is this fragrance does a brilliant job highlighting the aspects of the fragrance that make it a Sheepra, okay? So the top has that beautiful bergamot, um, this beautiful sort of sprightly, citrusy bergamot smell. Even though bergamot's uh, not listed, I get a huge hit of bergamot from this in the opening. It's definitely there. And it's sprightly and energetic, and um, and and it's it really feels like this fragrance to me feels like a proper Sheepra, okay? And it says it on the tin, so it better be that, and that's exactly what it is. But you know, to have a Sheepra, you have to have a couple elements normally. There's normally things like um, bergamot in the top, some sort of labdanum somewhere in the composition. They say the labdanum is in the base, although I start to get it somewhere in the mid here. Um, but usually there's labdanum, and usually there's some sort of oak moss and patchouli uh, in the base. And I definitely get, even though there's no patchouli listed, I should mention, there is a little bit of this chocolatey patchouli vibe that comes through. So there's a lot going on in here, and your nose can sort of focus on one thing or focus on something else. For a fragrance lover, it's a brilliant composition to me because it really highlights the top, the middle, and the base of a fragrance that makes it a Sheepra, all right? Um, and so that energetic, uplifting green opening, standing in the forest, standing in, you know how if you've ever played like Zelda or something like that, there's a spot in the forest where the sunlight always shines through and there's this beautiful clearing. Um, Stephen King called it uh, clearing uh, clearing in the path or something like that. Uh, you know, and there's just this plat path that you're walking and all of a sudden you're at this clearing, right? And everything falls into place beautifully. The sunlight comes in, but you're still around nature and all that stuff. That's, that's sort of what the, um, uplifting green opening reminds me of. The middle highlights this brilliant labdanum, okay? I love labdanum as a note. I've said it a million times, but, you know, fragrances like Sahara Noir by Tom Ford, which I'd love a bottle of one day. Um, fragrances like, uh, for example... Uh, the Zoo's Everlasting, that's a beautiful labdanum fragrance uh, by a house that I would love to smell more of, of the Zoo's work. And, um, of course, you could list things like Le Lyon by Chanel. There's so many beautiful labdanum fragrance, he labdanum heavy fragrances. But this just does a fantastic job highlighting that labdanum. And it changes into that, you know, that um, sprightly opening as the hours tick by, and you don't have to wait too long. That's why I say I think it's really in the mid. I get more of the labdanum coming, bubbling up to the surface much quicker. And um, it, um, it, it really gives a brilliant resinous-like feel to the fragrance. So the fragrance comes across as being very resinous. You have to pay attention, I think, because some people can miss 
um, this beautiful labdanum that, that comes out to me in the mid, but they say is in the base. And, um, you know, it can give off this resinous, but also leathery vibe. And there is a leather note listed in the base, but that could be coming from part of the labdanum as well. And then the base, of course, that gives it this forest floor. Imagine like pine needles falling on a forest floor and decomposing over time. You know, it has this earthy, um, oak mossy, textured. Oak moss is very textured feeling when it's done well. And here, you can really smell uh, the the texture. It feels like you're it feels like you're literally touching the oak moss with your hands. It's a brilliant, brilliant composition. And then, of course, they add their own twist, right? So they don't just try to copy Mitsuko or something like that. Well, this came out in 1914, they said. So technically, I guess this came out before Mitsuko. Um, so they don't just try and copy, I guess, Koti, Shipra, or whatever it was. Um, they try to do their own thing. And uh, so they mixed in this mushroom note with roasted chestnuts. Two very interesting notes. And I think um, the nuttiness of the chestnut is really something you do not have to wait for. I got it in the beginning uh, when I've worn this. When I've sprayed it, um, sometimes I'll really feel like that uh, uh, chestnut note really pushes into the top. You know, when you first spray, even though you're focusing on all, all of those fresh, green, sprightly, they say green shoots, um, wild fennel like like smells. Um, there is this sort of um, you know chestnutty, nutty note pushing through. And and normally it's interesting because if I saw a new release that had chestnut as a note, I would probably roll my eyes. Probably roll my eyes and let out a deep sigh because it seems like it's a gimmick nowadays to in, to introduce hazelnut or chestnut or all that bullshit. And they don't do them very well in the new fragrances. This is not a gimmick. In fact, this does a fantastic job of feeling like a vintage, classy, and classic fragrance, um, while also being like a reference Shipra, reference earthy fragrance, and maybe even you could say a reference nutty fragrance, because there it's hard to do a proper nutty fragrance. You know, maybe you could look at something like... Um, Maybe you could look at something like uh, Fat Electrician as having this like nutty vetiver or something like that, right? Uh, but it's hard, for the most part, to my nose, it's hard to do a nutty fragrance. A lot of the stuff they do nowadays is just too sweet or focuses on the wrong things. This one does not focus on the wrong things. For me, this focuses on the right things. And that the way that the nuttiness, the chestnut, the pine needles on the forest floor are done, um, there's a note of... Humus, which if you go, interestingly enough, if you go watch uh, Lofts from the Loft, Wafts from the Lofts video on this three years ago, um, they were saying, is that hummus? That can't be hummus. It, it, no, it's not hummus. Uh, they're, they're basically saying that there's a soil note, like an earthy note, like a peat moss earthiness, you know? Um, that's that humus note that they have listed there. Um, and... So the other thing that is particularly noteworthy about this fragrance that I think is meant to worth mentioning, let's say, is the price. Because seven years ago, if you look for Ariza El Legrand Chipre Mousse, seven years ago, Sebastian did a, did a review of this fragrance. And he said he bought it in Europe, so it was cheaper. He was in France or something. So he bought a, he bought a bottle there, and a 100 ml bottle was 120 euros, okay? Now, it's seven years later, and you can buy a 50 ml bottle for 120 euros, or you can buy a 100 ml bottle for 150 euros. Now, if you've been following perfume prices over the last seven years, let's say, you're probably thinking exactly what I'm thinking. If you're out of the game, if you're, if you're not someone that follows perfume prices normally, uh, you're probably like, wow, okay, 150 bucks is not cheap, right? But a lot of these niche houses nowadays, they just pop up out of nowhere and everything is three, four, five, six hundred dollars right out of the gate, right? Not this. This is 150 euros for 100 mils. Beautiful bottle, beautiful presentation, all that stuff. Um, I think this is a steal. I think that this is an unbelievable value for this type of perfumery. You cannot find this type of perfumery nowadays for 150 bucks, for 100 mil. You know, 30 mils more, they double the juice? Sounds insane. Uh, it sounds like a great deal to me. And um, so if you're in the market for a proper Shepra, the price on this is also very, very fair. I think that is very... They have the right to raise the price again, let's say, in my in my opinion. This should easily be 200 bucks for 100 mil, uh, if not more. 
But um, the other thing that, that, that I should mention for my perfume lovers is that this fragrance transitions and it transitions brilliantly. It transitions, um, you know, like, like a fine sport, like a fine luxury automobile transmissions, one, one shift, one gear shift to the next. Uh, and there's not, um, it's not like there's like four or five different transitions or anything like that. But to me, there's one big one. The big one is the difference between that uh, opening that is really focused on the green, earthy, sprightly bergamot earthiness and switching as it as it continues to dry down. Once you get to about the one to two hour mark, you'll notice more and more of that resinous labdanum with some resinous galbanum coming through. And those two resins come together to create, in my opinion, a beautiful resinous composition. And as it continues to dry, you'll pick up more and more of the oak moss and chestnuts and humus, the soily note, the earthy note, the mushroomy note, which I guess you could kind of stick the mushroomy note and the earthy note together. Um, and, and, you know, sort of like this decaying pine needle, green textured oak moss like smell. There's a little bit of vetiver, a little bit of balsams, a um, little bit of violet leaf as well. Just a little bit of violet leaf. Nothing, you're not going to, don't expect Fahrenheit here or anything like that. It's not some big in your face violet leaf, but it's there. It's there to provide I think it just sort of brackets the, you know, the, the violet leaf almost like brackets the galbanum and the labdanum, which really, I think, take over the fragrance. Those two resins, to me, take over. And um, I think even the leather isn't a true leather note. I think it's like a subsection of the labdanum, if that makes sense to you. And, um, but the complexity, I mean, the way it transitions, the complexity, and the brilliant smell of the materials in this... Um, I, uh, I I really like Sheep or Moose. This is one I could recommend to people. Now, um, so I love everything about the fragrance. I love the nod to the past. I love I love all of it. Um, and so one one other thing I will mention into the base, even though it's not listed, there's a little bit of a tobacco like vibe. This sort of dry, um, you know, hay like tobacco like feeling. Uh, does start to come through and mixing with that earthy chocolatey patchouli if you will those are two notes that are not listed that even add to the complexity so forget the clover and mastic and violet leaf and galbanum and labdanum and mushrooms and hum humus and pine needle I almost said hummus pine needles vetiver leather uh, roasted chestnut you know uh, uh, on top of all of that you still get that chocolatey patchouli, which is not listed, and you still get a little bit of this, um, you know, tobacco, hay-like vibe. Um, and so add it all together, and to me, you have a hit. This is a pure hit for me. Um, now, uh, the bigger problem for me is with my collection, am I going to go out and buy a bottle of this? I honestly, probably not. And as, 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 that's part of the issue when you have such a big collection because there's so much still for me to wear. There's so many Sheepras still that I want to wear. And this is not counting my bottles of Mitsuko and my bottles of Diaghilev and, you know, Roja's Houtlux and all these Sheepras that I, I still have to wear. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, it doesn't count Roja's Femme. It doesn't count all of these fragrances that I love that are technically considered Sheepras, if you will. Um... So for me, I would definitely recommend this to somebody who wants to get a good value for money sheep or to really understand what the category is like. Again, this has its own twist uh, with that earthy nuttiness that is unique. But um, this is a great example of a sheep rope to me. Uh, but in my personal situation with my collection being probably out of control, um, am I going to go spend $150 on a bottle of this? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I will. Uh, I will say thank you to Nick for allowing me to do a video on it. Thank you for sharing the decants. Very, very kind of you, my friend. And he's sending me some more stuff just, just in case I'm not loaded enough on stuff to talk about on the channel. So it's great because I get to talk about a ton of stuff. I get to explore a ton of stuff. Thanks to you guys. Um, and, and so, uh, but am I going to go buy a bottle of this? Not unless like, Unless one falls in my lap at just an unbelievable deal or a partial that is almost like given to me, 
I don't think I will. I don't think I will just because, um, now is it full bottle worthy though? Yes, apps a hundred percent. I think it is, especially for my taste. It's just, I have, I have so much to wear already that you can only wear so much, even if you wear, um, even if you wear, you know, uh, uh, one fragrance as your scent of the day and then like four fragrances before bed, which I'll do sometimes. I'll put one here, one here, one here, one here, you know, and you and then you're wearing five fragrances a day. How long is it going to take to you for you to wear everything if you have 800 bottles or whatever, 600 bottles or um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of the, the issue I'm in right now. So I'll just say thank you to Nick for sharing this and great intro to the brand. The other thing I will say, though, is that this video and getting to know the house of Ariza El Legrand like I have with this makes me want to explore more from the house. That is one thing I will say. I definitely want to smell the rest of the lineup because this is quality quality stuff at a very fair price, which is hard to find nowadays. They have a leather. They have a, a leather from, from 2015, I think it came out. Um, they have a bunch of fragrances, uh, actually. They've got Horizon. They've got uh, La Fleur d'Orangeur, very similar setup to Serge Luton's. Um, they've got Gentry Jockey Club. They've got Heliotrope. They have Horizon. Um, they have a lot of fragrances, so I, I definitely a house that I want to explore more from. I'll tell you that right now. This de the Vetiver Royal Bourbon, I'd love to smell. I think I might have a sample of that, actually. So, yes, a house you'll be hearing more about on Channel Ram. Let's put it that way. So, if you have experience with uh, Shepra Moose, do leave me a comment. Um, appreciate everyone watching. Everything that you guys do for the channel, being here, supporting it, it really does mean a lot to me. And uh, probably do another video tonight. And then tomorrow, we are going to do the top 100 countdown. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. It's going to be a top 100 countdown, one I've never done before. So uh, thanks for watching. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.